intersection of the pectoral region and axilla. Basically, there are three major muscles in the pectoral region. The very prominent pectoralis major. Deep to it, we have the pec minor, and then last but not least, the subclavius. The function of these three muscles is to attach the upper limb to the axial skeleton. The pec major is positioned immediately deep to the superficial fascia. In females, this would be immediately deep to the breast. In this section, you're going to do the following. You're going to study and reflect the pec major. This will then kind of look like this. Then you're going to do the same thing with the pec minor, just like indicated here. Following that, we're going to study a couple of branches of an artery. I will show you in a moment, which is called the thoracoacromial artery. In a cadaveric dissection, once all the skin has been carefully removed and the subcutaneous tissue, this is what it would actually look like. Here's your pectoralis major. Here are some cutaneous branches of nerves. Here's a muscle called the serratus anterior, which prevents winging of the scapula. And its nerve is actually right here, called the long thoracic nerve. This region is called the deltopectoral triangle or the deltopectoral groove. We can find in it a vein which is named the cephalic vein. The pec major has two different heads. One is the clavicular head as it attaches to the clavicle. The other one is called the sternocostal head, right here. The tendon of the pectoralis major can be traced all the way to its lateral attachment on the humerus. The pec major flexes, adducts, and medially rotates the humerus. If we remove or at least reflect the pectoralis major, we should be able to see something that looks somewhat like this. This muscle here is the pec minor, and running on its anterior surface is this nerve here, which is the lateral pectoral nerve. This here actually does not innervate the pec minor, it only innervates the pec major. This nerve here is called the medial pectoral nerve. It pierces the pec minor, innervating it, and it continues its way to the pectoralis major. So, a mnemonic we can use to remember these two nerves and what they innervate is lateral less, medial more. The lateral does less because it only does the major, and the medial pectoral does both, so it does more. In addition to that, we also have this artery here, which is the thoracoacromial artery. If we still had the pec major on board here, so to say, we could see that the pectoral branch of the thoracochromial artery, together with the lateral pectoral nerve, both would enter the deep surface of the pec major as we have removed it here. We can't see this one anymore though. The subclavius muscle is sitting right up here, inferior to the clavicle. It attaches to the clavicle and to the first rib, and when it contracts, it depresses the clavicle. Lying on top of this would actually be another layer of fascia called the clavipectoral fascia. It's usually immediately deep to the pec major. Superiorly, this fascia is actually attached to the clavicle, so it would be lying both superficial and deep to the subclavius muscle and the pec minor muscle. Inferiorly, this fascia would then become continuous or become attached with the axillary fascia. Let's go ahead and study both the thoracochromial artery and its four branches after this has all been cleaned up. We'll have a look at this diagram or this figure from your dissector. You'll see there is a pectoral branch right here, which will descend between the pec major and pec minor. You should have already seen it on your way to the pec minor. That's usually actually the largest branch coming off of the thoracochromial artery. You should also have a deltoid branch, which we can see here in this little image. It'll course laterally in the deltopectoral groove between the deltoid and the pec major muscle. This here usually accompanies the cephalic vein. There's also an acromial branch, which as the name indicates, passes superior to the coracoid process and then towards the acromion. And it could actually arise, as we can see here, as a branch of the deltoid branch. So already a couple of centimeters away from the thoracochromial artery, which we would describe as the parent artery to all these branches. Then, last but not least, Here's the clavicular branch, which courses superiorly and medially to go to the subclavius muscle and the sternoclavicular joint. So in a cadaveric dissection, here we have the pec minor reflected. Please note that in this, in this picture, this is not how we're going to do it. We're going to reflect it upwards. Yeah? We're going to cut it off from its distal attachments on the ribs here and then reflect it upwards. But Nevertheless, you can see a couple of interesting structures here. Not everything's labeled, but here's your thoracochromial artery and some of its branches. For instance, here's the subclavius, here's the medial pectoral nerve, 
and the pectoral branch of the thoracochromial artery. Next off, let's have a look at the axilla. The axilla is a region between your pectoral muscles, the scapula, the arm, and the thoracic wall. And it's a very important region for the passage of nerves and vessels that travel from the root of the neck into the upper limb. We are going to find a lot of structures in here. To name a few, that'll be the axillary sheath, which contains the brachial plexus, the axillary vessel, so the axillary artery and vein, their respective branches, axillary lymph nodes, portions of three different muscles, and a considerable amount of fat, which is not always really in favor of facilitating the dissection of this region. Let's have a look at the walls and boundaries of the axilla. In this artistic impression, we can see that it looks a little bit like an oblong and misshaped pyramid. Either way, the apex of the axilla, which would be located right here in green, is bounded by the clavicle anteriorly and the superior border of the scapula posteriorly and medially by the first rib here. The base of the axilla would be right here or down here, indicated in an orangey color, is just made up by skin and fascia of the armpit. The anterior wall here and here is made up of the anterior axillary fold from the pectoralis major muscle the pec minor muscle, and clavipectoral fa fascia. The posterior wall, here in a kind of light green, and here, is made of the posterior axillary fold from the teres major and latissimus dorsi muscles and the subscapularis muscle, which covers the anterior surface of the scapula. The medial wall, as we can see lying right here, is the upper portion of the thoracic wall and the serratus anterior muscle, which I just showed a few slides ago. And last but not least, here is the lateral wall, which is made by the intertubercular sulcus of the humerus. In brief, the dissection is going to go as follows. You're going to reflect the pec major and pec minor muscles, and then expose the contents of the axilla. We're going to be quite rigorous with the veins we encounter because we are going to remove them so that they're not in the way and so that we can freely and at leisure study the axillary artery and its branches and of course the brachial plexus. Let's have a look at the axillary artery with help of this image from the sector again. The axillary artery actually starts at the lateral border of the first rib when it is actually the continuation of this one, the subclavian artery. It ends at the inferior border of the teres major where its name then changes to the artery of the arm, which would be the brachial artery. It's important to know that we have three parts of this artery. The first, the second, and the third part. The first part will extend from the lateral border of the first rib to the medial border of the pectoralis minor muscle. The second part is posterior to the pectoralis minor, and the third part will come from the lateral border of the pectoralis minor to the inferior border of the teres major muscle. Just as there are three parts, these three parts have corresponding branches. The first part has one branch, which would be the superior thoracic artery. The second part has two branches, which would be the thoracochromial artery and the lateral thoracic artery. The third part has three branches, which would be the subscapular artery. It's actually a pretty big branch in lab, you'll see. And then two circumflex humeral arteries, a posterior and an anterior circumflex humeral artery. About that lateral thoracic artery. In some case, about 35% of the time, the lateral thoracic artery is actually going to come from the subscapular artery or the thoracochromial artery. So let's have a look at this in a cadaveric dissection. See, now we've cleaned up some more of the muscles and everything. And here is our axillary artery. And here's the first branch, the superior thoracic artery. Then we have the second part, which has two branches. And these two branches will be the thoracochromial artery and the lateral thoracic artery. And the third part has three branches, the posterior, anterior circumflex humeral, and subscapular artery. Subscapular, posterior circumflex humeral, and anterior circumflex humeral. Note here, you can tell the anterior and posterior part very easily because the posterior is way, way bigger than the anterior. Noteworthy here is that the subscapular artery, after traveling a short distance, will divide into the circumflex scapular artery and the thoracodorsal artery. The circumflex scapular artery goes to the muscles of the posterior surface of the scapula, and the thoracodorsal artery goes to the latissimus dorsi. There's also going to be numerous unnamed muscular branches. Now let's move on to the brachial plexus, one of the major parts of this dissection. In this video, I'm only going to treat the brachial plexus very superficially because it's too complex and would need too much time dedicated to it to go into detail. If you want to review more of it, I would recommend the book Clinically Orientated Anatomy, 7th edition. This here is a figure from that book, as is 
this figure as well. In lab, we are going to focus on the infraclavicular part of the brachial plexus. The supraclavicular part, so the roots and trunks, will be dissected with the neck. The three cords of the brachial plexus, the lateral, the posterior, and the medial cord, are actually named according to their relationship with the second part of the axillary artery. All four of these structures are going to be very close together, right behind or posterior to the pectoralis minor muscle. Go ahead and identify a couple of branches of the brachial plexus. For instance, the musculocutaneous nerve, which will pierce the coracobrachialis muscle. To find the lateral cord, use your fingers and follow this nerve proximally. And here is the lateral cord, and then here is the medial cord. If you follow this down again, you're going to see that the, la that the lateral cord also gives rise to a large branch, which is the lateral contribution to the median nerve. To find the medial cord, trace the medial root of the median nerve proximally. A part of the medial cord will just continue distally as the ulnar nerve. Note that the three terminal branches, which are going to be the musculocutaneous, the median, and the ulnar nerve, all form the letter M. See if you can find the medial and lateral pectoral nerves as well. You could find these by tracing them from the reflected pectoral muscles to their origins from the medial and lateral cords respectively. See if you can identify these two nerve branches that arise in the inferior side of the medial cord, which are going to be the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Pull the axillary artery a little bit out of the way and then you should be able to see the posterior cord. I'll demonstrate this on the next picture. Here you go. Now everything that was in the way has been removed. Here's your posterior cord and the branches of your posterior cord are going to be your subscapular nerves. Actually the middle subscapular is also called thoracodorsal, the radial and the axillary nerve. Note the quadrangular space which we have already seen doing the shoulder from posteriorly. Now you can see where the axillary nerve comes off the posterior cord and actually dives into the quadrangular space. And it's time for Blitz Anatomy. Pectoralis major, innervated by medial and lateral pectoral nerves. Deep to it, pectoralis minor, only innervated by the medial pectoral nerve. Deltoid muscle, innervated by axillary nerve. Subclavius, serratus anterior, attaches to the ribs here and protracts the scapula, so it prevents winging of the scapula. Innervated by the long thoracic nerve, right here. Subclavian so artery, axillary artery. First part of the axillary artery, or first branch, is the superior thoracic artery, right here. Second part, is the thoracocromial artery and the lateral thoracic artery. The thoracocromial artery has several branches on its own. One branch is called the clavicular branch, one branch is called the pectoral branch, another branch is the acromial branch, and the last one, the deltoid branch, named after their areas of distribution. High pectoralis minor, third part of the axillary artery, three branches, subscapular artery, which ultimately divides into two terminal branches, which would be the thoracodorsal artery, and circumflex scapular, which is not in this view. In addition, coming off the third part of the axillary artery are these two arteries, the anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries. Anterior and posterior. Brachial plexus, three cords. Lateral cord, posterior cord, medial cord, in relation to the axillary artery. Posterior cord, posterior to the axillary artery. Coming off of the lateral cord here, the lateral pectoral nerve. Coming off the medial cord, the medial pectoral nerve. Let's follow the brachial plexus down. We can see here the medial cord and its median contribution to the median nerve. Here we can see the lateral cord and the lateral contribution to the median nerve. If I hide the carcobrachialis, here is the musculocutaneous nerve which pierces the carcobrachialis. And this part of the brachial plexus actually resembles the letter M. Musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar nerve. Here's the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. If we ghost the axillary artery, we can see that the posterior cord will end up giving rise to the radial nerve and the axillary nerve, which we know passes through the quadrangular space together with this artery, the posterior circumflex humeral artery. The medial cord also gives rise to two nerves that are cutaneous. The medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. I'm hiding all the arteries now. Also arising from the posterior cord are the upper subscapular nerve, the middle subscapular or thoracodorsal nerve, and 
the lower or inferior subscapular nerve, lower subscapular, thracodorsal, and upper subscapular nerves. Continuing the terminal branch of the brachial plexus into the arm and the forearm, you will see the course of the median nerve through the cubital fossa, the course of the ulnar nerve on the ulnar side, so the pinky side, and the course of the radial nerve right here on the radial side.